Does a mysterious beast lurk in the remote mountains of central China? It looked like a monkey, but I was sure it was Yeren. The reports date back centuries. These creatures are also depicted on ancient Chinese pottery. Now, for the first time, China shares the evidence. Have you got the prints so we can see it? Monster Quest brings new technology to this ancient search. And scientists get a first chance to analyze the evidence. We'll get a sequence of DNA out of one or more of the hairs. While a team of experts explore a region where few outsiders have gone before. We may be the first Westerners to actually set foot on this spot. In a race with a clock to find new evidence of the Chinese wild man. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers. On Monster Quest. The People's Republic of China, an emerging superpower, the world's fastest growing economy, and with over one billion people, the most populous nation on the planet. But far from the crowded streets of Beijing and Tiananmen Square, something else makes its home here. Beyond the Great Wall, a creature the locals call Yeren. In English, the wild man. I saw two that looked human, they were standing. Smaller ones have been seen from say five foot five, but right up to seven foot, like over two meters tall. The sound was comparable to a human sound, but the pitch was higher. Standing upright and walking on two legs, which is the most distinctive characteristic, obviously, that, that I'm most intrigued by. The footprint is 17 inches long and measured with a ruler. There are many tales in China, particularly in the mountains. Most eyewitnesses describe the wild man as five to seven feet tall, walking upright on two legs with long reddish to brown hair. The creature is said to be muscular, but not as large as the North American Bigfoot and Canadian Sasquatch. China is one of the world's oldest civilizations, dating back more than six millennia. In the fifth century BC, famed poet Qi Yuan ruled the Hubei province and his writings tell of large and misshapen mountain ogres. Yuan's home was located in what is known today as the Shenongjie National Nature Reserve, an area many consider to be the home of the wild man. Centuries later, the Qing Dynasty poet Yuan Mei writes of creatures as monkey-like, yet not a monkey. It's a myth that goes back at least 2,000 years. Frank Poyer is a retired anthropologist from Ohio State University. In 1982, Poyer spent five weeks in China studying the endangered golden monkey. It was during this time that he first learned of the wild man from a local guide. I'm not fluent in Mandarin, so I only I picked up some of it, but not all of it. Something about Ye Ren, and I had no idea. I mean, not a clue as to what he was talking about. And he introduced the concept of this creature. During Poyer's visit, he was told many stories of the wild man and was even offered proof. A hair sample said to have come from a wild man. Poyer was skeptical of its authenticity. I remember it was red and orange and it was exactly like the hair of the golden monkeys. And as soon as they left, I threw it away. Subsequent trips to China's Hubei province produced physical evidence that Poyer found harder to ignore. Footprints, bones, and even more hairs. The trip in 89 was, was eye-opening, and I'm still not sure of what kind of conclusions I've drawn as a result of that trip. One theory he considers is simply misidentification. Uh, the golden monkey is a very rare species of monkey. Now, it doesn't walk on its hind feet, but if you stood it on its hind feet, that monkey itself uh, could be as much as five feet tall. With a three-foot tail, you now have an eight-foot creature. But is there another explanation? One that could lead deep into the archaeological history of China's past. Thousands of centuries. Giganto used to roam this, uh, this region. Dr. Jeff Meldrum is an anthropologist at Idaho State University. 
He is recognized around the world as a Bigfoot and Sasquatch expert. In fact, here in Hubei province, there are localities that have yielded Gigantopithecus teeth. The most recent fossils date to about 300,000 years ago. Uh, one of the biggest questions in my mind is whether there is a connection between the Yaren and the Sasquatch of North America. Do they share a common ancestry with Gigantopithecus? Standing nearly 10 feet tall and weighing as much as 1,200 pounds, Gigantopithecus is the largest of ancestral primates. Could a descendant of Giganto survive to this day? According to Meldrum, some animals found in the Far East, such as the white bear and giant panda, are extremely rare and have survived for thousands of years. In some ways, one might ask, why wouldn't a primate, a large uh, ape for that matter, have been able to survive and persist into the present if a, if a, a bear was able to? Could wild man reports be evidence of descendants of Gigantopithecus still stalking the remote forests of China? Well, to me, the size of Yeren is comparable to Gigantopithecus. Professor Zhou Gaojing is the retired head of anthropology and senior curator of the Beijing Natural History Museum. We heard this report of a four-foot-high creature that was yellow and brown walking in the bush. On May 14, 1976, six officials from Shenanjia were driving along a highway near Shanche when they came across a strange creature covered in reddish fur. The sighting generated a great deal of public interest, so much so that the government began an investigation. Because of this report, we organized a large-scale investigation. Less than a year after the sighting, Professor Gaoxing helped lead a team of more than 100 scientists, soldiers and photographers into the Shenongjia Nature Reserve. Located in central China, this wilderness is one of the largest and most remote in the world. It's also said to be home to the wild man. During the research, we collected a lot of footprints, including this one. It does not belong to human or bears or any other animal we know. We have mainly two types of reports from the eyewitnesses. The creature was four feet or six to seven feet tall. And then the color of the hair changed from bright red color to brown, black, even multicolored. With long arms and they can stand up. Now, in an effort to unlock the mysteries of the Chinese wild man, Monster Quest will examine the body of evidence collected over the past 30 years. Evidence never before shared with the Western world. Recovered footprints and hair claimed to be that of the Chinese wild man will be examined. And aided by Professor Gaojing's expertise, trackers from three continents will search the Shenongjia forest for new clues. Hi. Hello, Professor Joe. You're welcome. Pleased to meet you. Jeff Meldrum. Yes, this is the very first time a U.S. anthropologist has had a chance to examine any substantial evidence. Yes, this is interesting. Yeah. Can, can you tell me about this footprint? This one, just right. You see? This part very really large. Mm -hmm. Just the egg. Maybe it belong to the ape man. Well, this is this is very different than our Sasquatch track. And do you think that these toes are, are extended this or are they part. are they folded under? Yes. Okay. This so curled at least. Yeah, yeah. See part. Maybe it maybe slid. Yeah. Okay. So the length may be somewhat so, exaggerated. Yes. Well that's very interesting. Very different than what I yeah. had expected. Professor Gao Xing and Dr. Meldrum will journey to the Shenongjia, the area the footprints were found, nearly 900 miles from Beijing. Joining them is British tracking expert Adam Davis. My ultimate goal is to try and prove that there's something out here. Davis is the first to arrive in Muyu, just outside the Shenongjia Nature Reserve. 
The small village will serve as a temporary base camp for the Monster Quest team. That's where most people say they've seen the Yeren in and around this area, and that's where they've seen the Yeren for centuries. Ah, Mr. Shu. It's so good to finally meet you. Davis has enlisted the help of local tracker and amateur wildband researcher Shu Shua Guang. Li Chahua. Li Chi River. Li right. Right, that's exactly where I want to go because that's where the last sighting was in November 2007. On November 18, 2007, just outside of Muyu, this man said he crossed paths with the Yeren. Dong Wang and his family were traveling down a remote dirt road near the Lichi River at the northern foot of the Lajun Mountains. The group was on their way to a local tourist spot when something crossed their path. I was asleep in the van, and all of a sudden, the driver shouted. They stopped the car as quickly as they could. I could see it from this side. The head looked large, maybe because of the hair. It was dark brown. Fearful but curious, Wang and a friend got out of the car to try to get a photo. I was nervous. I was very nervous. Wang says the creatures briefly stood behind some brush before making their way towards the river and out of sight. What I saw was two creatures, human-like, and they stood up. The location of the sighting is near the Lichi River, more than two hours' trek from Muyu. As Davies and Xu Shuo Guang reach the location, the clear skies have turned gray. They must work quickly before the road becomes too wet and dangerous to travel. Yeren, right. Brilliant. This is the spot where the Yeren was seen in November 2007. What I think we should do is follow this trail down here and see if we can find a good place to set up the camera trap, right by the water's edge. Less than 20 feet from the road, Davis finds plaster particles in the ground. He'd had no idea a cast had been made by Shua Guang. Mr. Zhu, this is a really good piece of evidence, and I'm very excited about it. Have you got the print so we can see it? Fantastic. As the gentle rain turns to a downpour, Davis hurries to set up the camera trap. It's one of two the team was permitted to bring into the country. I'm going to set one up here. The reason I've chosen this space is because I can see right across the river. OK, it's good to go. Davis heads out to show Dr. Meldrum the footcasts shared by Shaw Gwai. Adam. Hey. Yeah. Good to see you. Nice to see you, mate. Thanks ever so much trip. for coming. You bet. Well. It's uh, smaller than I might have expected rather tapered calcaneal pad. These, um, I have to say overall, my impression is that, that uh, we may very well be looking at bear tracks. Mm -hmm. One of the animals that roam the Shinongia is the panda bear. It is unlikely witnesses would confuse it with the reportedly dark-haired Yerin. Now, there's also the possibility that what was seen had nothing to do with these tracks that were already there present at the site. I mean, That's bears true. are common. But uh, I think there's other evidence out there, and we should, uh, we should keep looking. Sounds good. Dr. Meldrum and Davis pack up and head out. Their next stop, Shinongia, the land of the wild man. The Shinongia Nature Reserve is an area of approximately 1,250 square miles, divided into two regions surrounding Muyu. With six peaks measuring 9,000 feet above sea level, it is known as the roof of central China. Witnessing the park for the first time has really been overwhelming. The landscape is just uh, awe-inspiring. The, the uh, elevations are extreme. But just as expectations are running high, there is a problem. The government officials on site won't allow them into the park. The expedition could be over before it even begins. Dr. Jeff Meldrum and tracker Adam Davis have arrived at the gates of the Shunongia Nature Reserve, 
anxious to look for evidence of China's wild man. But there is a problem. One of the things about traveling to new locations while we're filming in China is that wherever we go, uh, we have our own special entourage, police, um, photographers, um, local government officials, all who want to help us along, but also um, sign copious amounts of paperwork. The team has been granted only 36 hours in the park to look for the wild man. With the sun going down over the mountains, Davis is concerned about losing valuable time. Right now, um, the local police are having a bit of a discussion, a bit of an argy-bargy with our guides as to whether we can go. An hour goes by. The team finally gets the go-ahead to move forward. From here, they will take their packs and equipment to nearly 10,000 feet and begin their search for wild man evidence. Yes, Professor Gao Jing offers some last-minute instructions before the team heads out. The trek to nearly 10,000 feet is too strenuous for him to join the team. From here, they will be led into the reserve by local tracker Chu Sha Guang and park ranger Yu Hao Yuan. It is Yuan who claims to have spotted the wild man in 1994 while out on patrol. Early in the morning on April 4th, 1994, while walking a remote hillside deep in the park, Yuan saw something unfamiliar to his well-trained eyes. He was about a third of a mile away. A professional with over 15 years experience as a ranger, Yuan knows every animal in this forest. But this was something he'd never seen before. The Yeren was sleeping, so I yelled to try to wake him up to see what he would look like. He just kept lying there, looking at us. To get a better look, Yuan sat and watched the creature with his binoculars. It was like a brown, kind of reddish brown, that kind of color. It was about 16 inches higher than me, so that means over 6 feet high. After a few minutes, the creature got up and walked away. I wasn't really sure that was Yeren, but it was kind of weird that he walked off on two legs. It wasn't a bear. That was nearly 15 years ago. Yuan is anxious to show these experts where he encountered the wild man. As they hike towards their destination, they notice plenty of recent animal activity. It looks like a large uh, antelope. What we've got here is an antelope track. You can see the difference between this and the deer track. Obviously, with the deer track, you saw two toes, for want of a better word, were smaller. <laughs> Another hour goes by before the team arrives at camp. Elevation 9,500 feet. Just think, we may be the first Westerners to actually set foot on this spot. And this is a this is a really good spot to make camp. Yeah. We've got yeah. what a couple of hours before um right. before nightfall. Right. Let's set up camp and then go out and do some scoutings for tonight's stay camp. Great. What we're going to do with the remaining light is go out and scout to see um, some good locations where we can use the thermal camera. Just a few hundred yards from camp, they find an ideal location, a watering hole that's teeming with recent animal activity. Well, these are great spots up, up on these saddles where there aren't really any perennial streams to speak up. The water sources are things like this, seeps and springs. And ponds that the animals come to, to to drink. Both Dr. Meldrum and Davis believe that if the wild man lives in this park, like other animals, it will need plenty of food and water to survive. So this is really a perfect observation post to set up the thermal camp. With nightfall quickly approaching, Davis heads back to camp to retrieve the thermal camera. Conducting research within China's borders is a privilege that few Westerners have ever experienced. Retired anthropologist Frank Poirier is one. In total in China, I must have spent uh, at least a year, if not more, uh, in various parts of China. And then in 89 was uh, the larger expedition that focused specifically on the Aren. It was on this trip that Poirier was given some interesting evidence. Uh, he said it was the hair of a Yeren. Now, after 20 years and advances in DNA analysis, 
there may be a way to prove the claim. Ideally, from uh, the DNA test, we'll get a sequence of DNA out of one or more of the hairs. Dr. Andrew Merriweather is a molecular anthropologist at Binghamton University in New York. He will be conducting DNA analysis on the hair to determine its origin. The process is a sort of three steps. The first is extracting the DNA from the hair. Then the next step is involves um, making copies of that DNA. And then the last step is we sequence it. We learn the actual sequence of that stretch of DNA for that hair. Finally, the hair will undergo a species identification test that will compare the DNA to other known animals. Okay, these are the actual samples. Extracting DNA from hair samples yields the best results when the root of the hair is intact. You can see it's just a tiny fragment, no root bulb. As Merriweather heads into the lab to begin the extraction process, 7,000 miles away, Davis, Meldrum, and their team are moving into position for the stakeout. Nothing like this has ever been used to hunt for the Yaren before. The FLIR Thermovision Scout Imager is typically used by law enforcement agencies in search and rescue operations. We had to get special permission from um, the Beijing authorities to use this. After sunset, Davis moves on to begin the baiting of the watering hole. We've got some stuff from camp, and what we're going to do is bait this area. I'm baiting this area with, with banana skins. If I smell this, the, the, um, it has a very strong aroma, the banana, so, it's very, it, so the animals will pick it up. The logic behind this is we're trying to cover all the potential roots down into the water hole with fruits that the Yaren will like. So thereby, as it walks around, it eats, we can get a good view of it as it moves around here. And using the thermal, hopefully, we'll be able to capture its image. It's pretty steep here. Yeah. Technical. I can make it. Jeff, I'm having trouble finding you. Can you just wave your arms a bit, please? Yeah, I've got you. Perfect. Perfect. Now, from here, I can see Jeff. Absolutely perfect. I've got great visibility here. I can see absolutely everything. And if, um, if the urine does come, then I'm going to get it. They must remain completely silent. No movement or sounds of any kind, any noise could scare off the animals. Minutes turn into hours. It's nearly midnight now. Now we've been here about two or three hours. And there's been no trace of any animals so far. The hours pass with no movement. Finally, dawn begins to break. Animals are most active at dawn and dusk. These next couple of hours are critical as to whether we actually get to film it here or not. Davis waits as daylight gathers. It's been a cold, hard night, and we haven't found anything, which is obviously disappointing. Davis' frustration is shared by the entire team. Then, Yuan, the group's ranger, reveals fresh evidence. He possesses a cast of tracks left by the Yedin he spotted 15 years earlier. And this may be the most surprising find yet. Located in central China, Shunongjia Nature Reserve is one of the most remote and vast wildernesses in the world. With flora species dating back millions of years, and home to rare animals such as the panda and the golden monkey, there is speculation that it is home to another undiscovered beast, the Chinese wild man. It's just a remarkable and a vast uh, area. Monster Quest has been granted just 36 hours to search for the creature the Chinese called Yedin. With valuable time ticking by, Jeff Meldrum and Adam Davis plan to split up. Meldrum heads out to search for likely feeding areas, while Ranger Yuan will take Davis to the area where he found tracks in 2004. What, what I'm looking for uh, are signs and prints. The, the, the guy I'm with has seen um, the Yaren before and taken prints of it, so I'm hoping that he can identify it again. The area of the 2004 sighting is a few miles from last night's stakeout. We're um, on night over 9,000 feet now. Um, at high altitude in the temperate um, forest. It's great for tracking, and um, the conditions are perfect for picking up prints. 
it's tough going and you can feel it burning in your lungs as you, as you, as you climb up here. Um, but it's, it's awesome scenery and it's really exciting to be with such a great tracker. It's early in the spring. Most of the snow on the surrounding mountains has melted, which is good news for David. You can see here, if I just put my fingers in the soil here, it's very easy to make very distinctive prints today. Were we to go, say, in summer, when it's a lot hotter and drier, you may just get a dust trail up here. But today we've got optimum conditions, so I'm really excited and hope that we can find some excellent prints today. The two men don't have to go very far to find plenty of evidence that animals are on the move. What, you, uh, what, 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 what type of animal is it? An antelope. Uh. As you can see around here, what we're looking for is places where the animals will run into cover. So what the, what the antelope's done is go across that plain there and then run into the, um, into the brush just over the top of the brow of the hill. A what, sorry? Fox. What, what's the what's the fox been eating? Mouse, yeah. yeah. That's a good bit of fur there. Well, what we've seen so far is, is, is some deer. Now we've got some predators. The good things about looking for tracks out here is the fact that it's it's a wilderness populated by rare and 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 extremely unusual animals. Animals that are only found in this area. The downside is that it's vast. While Davis and Yuan search for tracks, Dr. Meldrum is searching for likely food sources that would enable a large creature to survive in this wilderness. Well, these alpine meadows are vast and impressive. And there's um, these very obvious food sources just uh, right underneath our feet. Here's an example of a a wild onion, scallion, and these are just everywhere, intermingled with the uh, grasses and sedges. A uh, good supply of uh, vitamins and minerals. Very mild, but they're tasty. Great. And these are all over. Dr. Meldrum sees a similarity between this environment and certain regions of North America. Regions where he searched for Bigfoot and Sasquatch. The, the, the landscapes are very, very familiar looking. The overall ecological patterns are remarkably similar. There's also, as we came up the trail, we noticed lots of burrowing activity of subterranean rodents, voles and gophers and so forth. These are a, a very, in America, are a very important food supply for, for bears and, and presumably other large omnivores. Based on what he's seen so far, Dr. Meldrum is certain if the wild man exists, this habitat could support a large primate. And so I think the Yaren could be very much at home here in these forests at the top of these mountains. Satisfied that the Chinese wild man could survive in this environment, Dr. Meldrum heads back to the town of Muyu to follow up on a report of a recent sighting. On September 15, 2005, while collecting herbs for Chinese medicine just north of Muyu, local farmer Jia Hangzhan claims to have seen the wild man. First, I heard something that sounded like a person, and then saw two creatures. One was six feet tall. Frightened, Jean tries to hide in the brush, a mere 50 feet away. I saw the face and it looked like a monkey, but more hairy. I could only see his eyes, and his nose was bigger than humans. I coughed, and that made the year and realized I was there, so they walked away slowly with a large stride. In order to better identify eyewitness sightings, Dr. Meldrum has compiled a book of photographs of various primates for comparison. He shows them to Jean to see if there is a match. Similar to this one. Yes, similar to this one. The mouth is closer to this one. Jean points to the orangutan as the creature that closely resembles what he saw. The color and length of the hair stand out, 
but not necessarily the size. When presented with a number of choices, the most common uh, identification by eyewitnesses is uh, of an orangutan. Orangutans currently inhabit only the islands of Borneo and Sumatra in Indonesia. But fossil evidence does show they once existed in China. There were orangutans on the mainland of China through the Ice Ages, the Pleistocene. Uh, however, they are thought to have gone extinct. Could the hair sample being tested in New York possibly be from an orangutan? Or is it the long-sought evidence of the Yerin? Locals living near the mountains of central China say a wild man walks within the forests of Shinonjia Nature Reserve. In 1976, after numerous eyewitness reports, the government launched a major expedition into the region in search of the creature. In 1976, many officials saw the same creature at the same time. In 1977, Professor Zhou Garjian led the expedition in Shinonjia that yielded numerous footprints, hairs and feces, presumed to be that of the wild man. Given the report, we started an investigation, during which we found a footprint, but we are not sure if it's from the creature. That expedition sent Garjing on a 30-year quest to find additional evidence of the creature. Working with Professor Gaojing, Monster Quest has taken up the search for this elusive beast. Well, in my hand, I have a, a couple of samples that were graciously provided us by Professor Zhou from his collection of hair samples that he has assembled over the years. These were particularly interesting, and, and uh, he thought we might like to uh, take these back to the States and, and have further analysis done. The hairs have been sent to Dr. Lynn Rogers, a biologist at the Wildlife Research Institute in Ely, Minnesota. Now well, let's see what we got. Dr. Rogers has been studying black bears for more than 40 years. He is also an expert in the field of hair analysis and identification. Whoa! It glows. It's kind of a weird... I have never seen this color in nature. At first glance, the hair is nothing like he's ever seen before. He must get a closer look. Okay, five and an eighth. Not many bear hairs are that long. Let me see what the ends look like on it. Putting the hair underneath the microscope should help determine the answer. I really am not sure that this is a real hair even. The color is completely unnatural. Rogers will send the hair to this man for further identification. We handle a wide variety of materials and do um, analysis on a scale that most other people, it's just too small for them to look at. Jason Beckett is a research microscopist at Microtrace Labs in Elgin, Illinois. Trained in the discipline of forensic analysis, Beckett and his colleagues examine evidence from around the world. Beckett will examine the suspected yet in hair under high magnification looking for characteristics that can potentially reveal its origin. You're looking at um, pigmentation, um, various microscopical features, so cortical fuci, which are essentially voids between hair cells in the cortex. And you take a cross-section of the hair and look at that shape and how that changes over the length of the hair shaft. These features of the unknown hair need to be evaluated against samples from known animals. We maintain a collection here at Microtrace of over a thousand animal hairs, and we use these to compare our known stamp standards to the questioned you know, material that we have. As the process of identifying the origin of the hair sample given to Dr. Meldrum intensifies, the DNA testing being performed on the Poirot sample is proving more difficult than anticipated. If this were from some unknown missing primate ancestor, then it should look be not similar to any other living primate, but still be a, obviously a primate sequence, so closer to the primates than any other species on the planet. But as of yet, the extraction has not proven successful. Um, the hairs don't have bulbs on the end, so they don't have the root, and really 95 or 99 percent of the DNA is in the root, and there's just a very tiny, tiny amount of DNA in the shaft. 
and all we got were shafts. And we do have a fair number of shafts, so there's still some hope. I've certainly gotten DNA out of shafts in the past, but the odds go down dramatically if you don't have the root. Another issue complicating the analysis could be the way the hair was extracted. DNA could be damaged in the sense that um, after you die, the cells break down and the DNA itself breaks down from chromosomes that are hundreds of millions of bases long down to pieces that are often as little as 500 bases long or 200 bases long or 100 bases long. And eventually it gets broken down so small that we can't recover it or we can't sequence it. So it may be somewhere on that continuum of, of damage that's happened after the, the hairs died and fell off the individual. The results are disappointing but not surprising given the age of the hair samples. And we don't see any DNA in these, these lanes. In this case, this primer set did not work for the samples. But it was, we did the chemistry correct because the, the test samples worked fine. The, the ones, the positive controls worked and the negative controls were negative so it wasn't contaminated. So it's um, back to the drawing board after this to try and see if we can change the conditions to see if there is any DNA that might be in here that we could make work. Merriweather will continue his efforts to coax viable DNA from the 20-year-old evidence. Meanwhile, tracker Adam Davis is headed to the location where a local farmer says he saw a creature in 2005. The site is just two miles north of the small town of Muyu. Davis wants to set up the last of his two camera traps. What I'm going to do is lay it on a tree, again, on, a, on, on, a, on, a, on an area that traverses two trails at an elevation with the water source down below. So I'm hoping that if there's urine active in this area, they're going to have to walk through here and obviously they need to drink. Okay, so it's armed and ready to go. As Davis wraps up the last camera trap in an effort to capture visual evidence of the Yedin, evidence already under evaluation deepens the mystery. Looking through the microscope, uh, we can see that the material is a deep red color, which does not appear to be natural. A creature that locals call the wild man is said to be roaming the mountains of central China. Sightings that date back more than 2,000 years suggest a creature that is five to seven feet tall, covered in reddish to brownish hair, and walks on two legs with a primate-like gait. This man says he saw two creatures walk in front of him while driving down a remote dirt road. This park ranger says a wild man he saw sleeping in the park left behind these footprints. This farmer says he came within 50 feet of a wild man. Scared for his safety, the farmer nervously ran off. And these two men are on a monster quest hunt for more evidence. My objective on this expedition is to try and find some evidence that the Yeren exists. Dr. Jeff Meldrum has already returned to the town of Muyu to follow up on a set of footprints Ranger Yuan found in the park in the year 2000. Well, here's some uh, footprint casts which may be a little different than the ones we looked at previously. These look much more similar to the uh, footprint casts from North America of Sasquatch or Bigfoot. So this, this would suggest a, a large flat-footed individual with five distinct toes. Uh, there's even a little indication of uh, midfoot flexibility, which is very familiar to me. But this broad heel particularly is, is distinctive. I mean, that's, if, uh, if that were absent, you could, uh, you might be able to dismiss these as, as bear tracks, rather large bear tracks. I mean, one of the most uh, exciting, I think, for me, uh, exciting aspects is there's this clear indication of a, of a pressure ridge here. Uh, this, uh, I've seen repeatedly in the Sasquatch tracks, which indicates a, uh, a flexibility of the midfoot. I don't see anything right off the bat that would uh, send up a red flag that these might be hoaxed or, or fabricated in some way. They appear to be very spontaneous. Uh, there's not, uh, there, there's no suggestion of embellishment. 
Dr. Meldrum has brought along copies of two Sasquatch footprints made in North America for comparison. And some of the similarities are, are quite striking. Obviously, the, the shape and proportions are, are very comparable. But it will take more evidence than footprints to convince skeptics. I, I think there's probably something on those camera traps. The first camera was set on day one of the expedition near the Lychee River, located two hours east of Muyu. It's also the site of the most recent wild man sighting. We may, if we've got lucky, um, get an animal, um, particularly around the Leitzer River where there's been um, a number of bear activities. Here, um, if we get something, it's most likely going to be the Yarrow. A review of the downloaded images show a herd of goats traveling through the area, but no evidence of the wild man. Davis will have to wait until the porter returns with a camera from the Leitzer River. It's his last hope for a photo. Meanwhile, he returns to town to meet up with Dr. Meldrum their expedition is nearly over. I feel very good about what we've accomplished and I think we've met the objectives that at least I personally set out to achieve and that was to establish contact with both the scientific community and with the uh, amateur enthusiasts who who very in a very similar fashion to what has transpired in the United States have sort of filled the void that has been left by by the uh, official posture. The porter has returned with a final camera trap. Davis' optimism is quickly dashed. There are no photos of the wild man. I mean, realistically, getting a photo would have been an optimum, but it, it's, it's very difficult to achieve. In New York, Dr. Merriweather has exhausted his supply of hair in the attempt to extract viable DNA. It would be interesting to resolve the question, since I think it would be pretty conclusive if we could get some sequence out of it. But what of the samples suspected of being artificial? Excited to see what the results of these. They, uh, they are coarse hairs that are a very deep reddish color, which uh, is why they are suspected to be Yaren hair. Ironically, the red color plays a larger role than anyone expected in identifying the origin of Meldrum samples. Research microscopist Jason Beckert has made a surprising discovery examining the hair under high magnification. So you can see these are most likely some dye that's recrystallized um, in the hair itself. So this would be um, conclusive proof that this is an artificial uh, coloring treatment. Uh, this is not a natural uh, color and the dye is something that would have to have been done intentionally by uh, humans to give the hair this color. And what species did the hair come from? We determined that it is a human head hair and uh, that hair has been dyed to have that deep red color and it most likely is uh, an Asian origin. Asian hairs tend to have a round cross-sectional shape as opposed to a more oval or even a flattened cross-sectional shape. It's not a matter of disappointment, it's a matter of uh, continuing to ask the, ask the pertinent questions and collect the pertinent data. With Monster Quest's search for wild men coming to an end, questions remain. Just what are eyewitnesses seeing in the mountains of China? The stories go back uh, of the era for centuries. Chinese scholars and poets are writing about the existence of hill monsters in these hills of Shenanjia in the 5th century BC. Just as Chinese scholars 25 centuries ago found the Yedin worthy of study and speculation, so too do the thinkers in modern-day China. And sharing their knowledge and evidence with the West is the next chapter in the quest for the wild man. That's extremely encouraging to me. And uh, you know, short of actually seeing a year, and I couldn't really realistically ask for more. And could similarities between footprints discovered on different sides of the world substantiate the existence of an unidentified primate? This uh, is very suggestive that, that there is an animal that uh, in, uh, in some ways is comparable to what we have hypothesized for the Sasquatch in North America. Even science must consider the possibility. The descriptions of wild man are not too much unlike the descriptions of the Yeti in the Himalayas and the so-called Sasquatch or Bigfoot in North America. 
which really leads one to wonder how three disparate creatures in these really far-flung regions of the world could be so described alike.